Hello, my name is Noel Tobin. I'm the Managing Director of Tobin No-Till. We design and manufacture displanting machines in Central West New South Wales. It's a great pleasure to bring you my thoughts on no-till farming. My observations are formed purely on what I see farmers doing. I have seen many farmers over the years make a success of no-till and my thoughts are based on their success. I am actually an ag engineer and have been involved in the manufacture of no-till planting machinery for about 20 years. Our Tobin planters are operated by a plethora of farming organisations. Some of the best farmers in the country are also using our machines and it is the results that they are achieving that make me confident to speak out on no-till practices. My comments herein are as a result of observing the best farmers in the country over many years and discovering what works and what doesn't work. I've seen with my own eyes, I've seen failures and have seen triumph and I'm taking this opportunity in this video to explain to you the opportunity you have to triumph in your farming system. No-till is a combination of farming practices that seek to use the natural organisms of the soil to obtain the best possible sustainable return from our soils. Organisms break down plant matter, biomass, into usable foods such as nitrates, phosphates and other trace elements which are necessary for healthy crop production. Biomass is decaying plant and animal materials, energy, Energy with so much potential to give us good sustainable crops for many years. Organisms such as worms, beetles, termites, bacteria, all living things. All living things and require a decent environment to thrive. Like most living things, they require access to oxygen, they require space, they require water, shelter, and of course food. No-till is all about creating an environment for the proliferation and health of the natural microorganisms in order to facilitate the breakdown of biomass. No-till methods store more carbon in the soil in the form of plant residue which bind particles together to improve the soil structure. The presence of organic material on top of the ground and over years in the ground creates an environment where all sorts of insects, bacteria, etc. can live all beneficial towards the breakdown of biomass, eventually to be used as plant food. The environment is invariably referred to as soil structure. When we say good soil structure, we mean a good environment to encourage the proliferation of all these bacteria and microorganisms. Perhaps the most important of these requirements is space. Living things need space. It's a basic. Most need space to travel. The food needs space to travel. The roots need space to travel. Space to store moisture space in the form of conduits to access oxygen, space to break down biomass, which provides, once again, which provides the food for crop production. Moisture needs to infiltrate where it falls, and to infiltrate it needs space, and it needs to be stored for crop protection. If it does not infiltrate, then it will run off to some dam causing erosion along the way and erosion, as we know, is an enemy of no-till. Moisture can only infiltrate if there is space. It can only infiltrate if there are voids to travel into. <clears throat> to achieve space and retain it, we need to reduce the compaction of our soils. If the soils are compacted, the voids will be eliminated, the spaces will collapse. There will be no space to store the elements necessary for an environment to support the proliferation and health of natural organisms. What is a safe level of compaction, you may ask? 
Well, it's kind of like smoking. Ask yourself, what's a safe level of smoking? Zero per day is best, one per day is worse. Ten each day is actually better than twenty, and so on. All I can say is keep compaction to a minimum. Every time you compact the soil, you're going to break down voids, you're going to collapse the spaces that keep the whole system going. That means keeping heavy machinery and stock off the land used for crop production. It is vital to keep traffic off the land when it is wet, as the voids will collapse quickly when it is wet and it will take longer to recover. Best practice is to use permanent tracks. Tram tracking we call it, where the same tracks are used year in year out to plant, to spray and to harvest. The tracks may or may not be planted, but the rest of the soil is left with zero compaction, encouraging an environment conducive to vibrant, healthy microbial activity. We need to reduce tillage. Tillage breaks down the soils into fines. Every time a farmer sends a tine or a disc through the soil, the natural activity is in some way disturbed, retarded or killed. Fines are an enemy of no-till. They fill up any voids that may otherwise be used for storage and other activity. And every single time a tine or a disc is dragged through the soil, more fines are created. For too long, farmers have been using planting rates much too high, resulting in good-looking crops early on, plenty of ground cover, plenty of green leaf material. Planting in wider rows and using lower planting rates is desirable for no-till. Wider rows means there will be less disturbance to the natural cycle of the microbes. When you do have a good year, it will still be as good or better than if you planted high plant populations, as wheat will tiller and canola will branch out like a tree and will have a longer growing season. Also, roots will go further into the ground. Traditionally, cultivation was used to control weeds and prepare a firm seed bed or so we thought. This is called conventional farming and is certainly conventional thinking. Cultivation is the enemy of no-till. It breaks down the natural structure of the soil. It demolishes the housing, the housing estates, the elements required to live in, the elements that are required to break down natural biomass. It opens up the soil to the atmosphere, resulting in massive moisture loss. When someone says they are cultivating to get ready for planting, what they are actually doing is creating fines, knocking down the houses where these elements live that encourage microbial activity, and they are also getting rid of the moisture. These methods are not sustainable in no-till. In no-till law, cultivation is a capital offence. Everything needs food and more. Some farmers say, we're not farming the land, we're farming moisture. Food and water is the secret to successful farming. Voids are the housing system to accommodate the organisms and elements needed to thrive. If rain is stored where it falls, oxygen will be mobile and food will be available. Even if you think you have loads of moisture, oxygen or food, it can always be improved. I'm sure if you conserve the moisture better, and use it where it falls and on the money part of the crop, you can increase your yield. I advocate a reduction in plant density, and some might say that's a contradiction in terms. If you're going to get higher yield, you want higher plant density. Reduce the plant density and plant on wider spacings. If you plant on narrow spacings and high plant populations to get a quick cover crop to combat weeds, you are merely replacing one weed with another, and the moisture will be gone in times of stress. Unfortunately, all these plants will suck up as much moisture as is available, with a high risk that there will be no moisture left to fill the hay. 
I have listened to farmers justify their farming methods using high planting rates. They say it was a really good crop early on, but unfortunately we just did not get the rain. My argument is that it did rain, however the moisture was used, or I'm going to say abused, early on generating loads of plants and green leaf and ensuring there was no moisture left to fill the head. Biomass is good, but it's only good if it's decomposed and used to manufacture grain. The money part of crop production. There is no upside to growing biomass at the expense of filling the head. It's better to plant in wider spacings as narrower spacings increase the risk of cracking between the rows during planting, which means more interruption to the housing system, the microbial activity, greater moisture loss and greater weed population germination, all enemies of good no-till practices. Wider spacings will ensure the available moisture takes on slow release characteristics. There will still be moisture to fill the head, which is the money part of the farming season. Filling the head is the money part of the season. That's, that's what we're doing. We're growing grain, we're filling the head. It matters nothing what the crop looked like back in June or whenever, if it does not yield a harvest. All our efforts must go towards the money end of the season. It's no good to decry the season as the cause of failure, near failure or a reduced yield, citing a lack of moisture. You must manage the farming system to ensure some of the moisture is stored to fill the head in September or October and not grow worthless green leaf material in June. If you insist on using crop as ground cover to combat weed growth in the winter, you should consider growing the full hog and grow a legume as a cover crop, which you may or may not harvest. Weeds are of course the enemy of most types of farming. It's no exception with no two. Weeds are the enemy. There's no point in reducing the plant population if you're going to let weeds run riot. Weeds are plants that compete with the crop for moisture. Weeds take up the space in the ground and above the ground. They take the light, the moisture from the weather. Weeds, 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 weeds are an enemy of no-till. The best way to eliminate weeds is to prevent them from germinating. If they don't seed, you don't need a regime to kill them. Spray the headlands. Tell your neighbour that you both need to work on containing weed germination. Consult your agronomist. Kill weeds as they germinate. Use rotations to control infestations. Use a hay crop and cut it before the weed goes forth to spread their evil seeds. Crop rotation is perhaps one of the most lethal tools in the no-till operation. Proper rotations can reduce or eliminate disease. It can be used to manipulate the voids in the soil. It can be used to replenish nitrogen in the soils. Crop rotation can also be used to reduce a root system to create a conduit for moisture to go deeper. It can be used as a tool in weed management. We can use crop rotation to improve the voids in the soil along with weed management and of course not forgetting the economic realities from year to year. Canola for example. Canola can improve the texture in the soil with its taproot, creating voids and even a conduit for water to go deeper. Canola also lends itself to in-crop spraying of different families of weeds that may not otherwise be possible with cereals and may be a good tool in weed management. Weed management is important in a no-till system, but it is best to implement a weed management program other than high plant population, and other than the constant application of herbicides, and dare I say, other than cultivation. Low plant population will preserve the moisture in the marginal areas and will give better yields and better quality grain. And that's what we want. <clears throat> Careful crop rotation mm -hmm. 
can assist in the creation of voids. Rotting plant material can create voids in the soil. This can take a few years and over time the results will come. All living things need shelter. Shelter is provided in the form of ground cover, preferably a living crop. But in any case, living or dead, humans will not thrive without shelter. So also with earthworms, termites and the like, the heat will be too much and there will be a moisture shortage and microbial activity will grind to a halt. Stubble retention, especially standing stubble, will give some ground cover. It will protect emerging seedlings against the sun. It will slow down wind and water speed at ground level. It is important to return organic material to the soil to feed bacteria and worms and termites and protect the soil during the summer sun. It is best left standing in its natural state. When it does rain, stubble will reduce the evaporation from the soils caused by the severe suns. Standing stubble will slow down wind and water speed at ground level. The main obstacle to stubble retention is the ability of the planting equipment to plant through high stubble loads and obtain good soil to see contact. This is the main reason farmers generally turn away from tines to discs. But there are many more reasons why planting using discs is desirable in a no-till system. Burning stubble is one of the enemies of no-till. Burning off stubble is a waste of money, a waste of energy, a waste of biomass that could otherwise be converted into food to feed your crop. The death penalty should be introduced for those burning off stubble. It causes pollution, it is deleterious to the community and the country and is a wanton waste of perfectly good fuel, vital to grow crops and contributes to poor soil structure. It is a waste of money and will affect growing of crops for years to come. Nature is not used to being sprayed every day with chemicals. Chemicals are artificial and in large doses stifling to microbial activity and deadly to worms and termites. Chemicals in the form of fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides should be reduced if possible. Use low fertilizer rates, but apply more often and alternate with natural manures. Intensive application of fertilizers may be inefficient and may be leached and reside outside of the area of activity. Intensive applications may also kill off microbial activity and animals, crucial to breaking down the biomass which provides food for the crop production. Plant wider to reduce the use of fungicides. Instigate a crop rotational plant aimed at eradicating weed infestations and disease. Spray when necessary, but if you plan ahead then chemical usage can be reduced. Firstly, Tines cause too much soil disturbance. They interrupt the natural microbial activity of the soils. It's like a bulldozer travelling across the villages, the houses in which the supporting elements live. They're all demolished. Secondly, the disturbance can create moisture loss by opening up the soil. Thirdly, they can and they do create fines, which fill the precious voids nature needs to store moisture. And lastly, in rocky ground, tines will pull up rocks, eventually covering the top of the ground with rocks, and they need to be picked. We must make a trench into which to place the seed. This trench is best made using a disc, as it will knock down less houses, destroy less habitat, open up less soil to the atmosphere, and produce less fines. Disc planters are desirable for no-till planting. Okay, we'll do double discs. First, a view from the sky. 
We've got a disc on each side opening up the soil. The boot is in the middle and it drops the seed down. At planting depth, these two discs will have to come together to open up the ground in the middle so that the seed drops down. Let's examine the section looking at the soil from the back. These are the forces the disc have to exert to create the trench on both sides. It's using compressive forces. So the disadvantage of a double disc opener include soil compaction. If these soils are hard, it is going to be difficult to push soil away to form the trench. Imagine ground already being hard. It's going to resist and push back against the disc. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. You're going to get a lot more compaction in this area. It goes without saying that this is the main drawback with using double disc openers. When you use these compressive forces, it will collapse the voids, create more fines, and worst of all, you're going to create smearing. It will smear the sides of the trench, and if it's moist at all, then the sun shines on it, it will dry out and it'll be hard as a rock. Because the forces required are much higher, you're going to have more stress on the components. We don't want to create extra work for the components. We don't want to create extra compression on the soils. The soils that are right beside the seed and we don't want smearing. Some manufacturers have a setup with the disc that open the soil with the disc angled to the direction of travel only. That's our planting boot. What happens in this case are the compressive forces are that way. Once again, very difficult to form a trench by using compressive forces. The compressive forces in the soils are going to push back. In hard soils, it's a lot more difficult when you push the soils together. They are going to form fines. This is detrimental to the whole idea of no-till. It compresses the soils and you get smearing. And farmers often complain about, particularly in compacted or wet soils, you get smearing on the sides of the trench. That's what causes it. Again, due to compressive forces, there will be high stress on components and brackets. What are we looking for? We are looking for a disc that's angled to both directions. If that's the direction of travel, and this is looking from behind, when the disc is angled in both the direction of travel and the vertical, then this is the planting depth. The forces used to make this trench are going to be tensile forces. They're going to tear the soil apart. This here has got many advantages. It's not using compressive forces. It's easy to penetrate. The soil is a lot more likely to peel away. It eliminates smearing. And because it is easier to penetrate, that throws up other advantages. It's going to be easier on the bearings, the bracketry, etc, etc. All the components of the disc. It's common to have discs down to 400 mm diameter. But our Tobin is 610, and there are a number of advantages to having a large disc diameter. The bearing is out of harm's way, of dirt, trash, logs, stones, rocks, rather than with the small disc. The green attack angle of the larger disc has a much better chance of pushing the stubble against the soil and using the resistance of the soil to get a clean cut and for longer, also resulting in a more effective cut. Whereas the red attack angle of the small disc, and it has a good chance of pushing the stubble along in front of it, rather than cutting it, will be more likely to bullnose. In rocky conditions, the large disc will roll over the rocks more easily than a small disc, increasing the life of the bearings and components.
Sticky soils in particular have been a great challenge for disc planter manufacturers. And But what actually happens? We have a boot going down in the shadow of the disc, releasing seed into the soil. The boot and the seed drop must be protected by a scraper, or some sort. And there are many different types of scrapers. The scraper acts as a conduit for the seed into the ground after it leaves the boot. It's vital that the scraper does not block up. The more stickier the soils are, the greater the tension must be on the scraper against the disc to prevent mud buildup. As a result, the scraper will act as a brake on the disc's rotation. The rotation of the disc is caused by the friction of the ground. The ground is pulling on this small disc and this is the leverage it has. When you go from 400 millimeters to 600, you've increased the leverage by one and a half times. 50% more leverage. And we all know more leverage is going to generate better torque and easier to turn. Much easier to keep operating in difficult, sticky conditions. It'll operate all day. Most farmers have used and abused their farms over the years. Many have cultivated the soils year after year, creating fines and profiles with little chance of storing moisture or fostering any microbial activity. Most farms have a hard pan to some extent or other. A hard pan is formed by time machines creating fines year after year. The fines then fall to the bottom of the cultivation level and when they get wet they will compact and when they dry out they will set like concrete. The road to No. 2 does have some rules and it's got twists and turns and farmers need to monitor the conditions. A soil test at the beginning will determine the condition of the soil and it should be remedied to fast track the foray into No. 2. Stubble retention and natural microbial activity will eventually assist to balance the nutrients in the soil but it is wise to apply whatever fertilizers or trace elements are deemed necessary at the beginning to fast track recuperation. If your farm is a hand pan, deep ripping at the outset to allow crops to intercept moisture and nutrients at depth is advisable. However, the first and most important step to know too is commitment. Having heard what I've said today would give you a better insight into what's required and why we're doing no to. Why we're creating an environment for the activity to flourish, for worms and termites and microbial activity to break down the biomass. Everything rotates around creating that environment, creating voids to, for moisture. If you're not convinced that that is what needs to be done, then you're in trouble to begin with. As they say a lot of the time, the first step to overcoming a problem is to realise, to admit that you've got one. So commitment is the biggest thing. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure to bring you my thoughts on no-till. They are my thoughts based on my experiences over the last 20 years or so. I am happy to receive your feedback and can be contacted by mail as follows. Noel Tobin at tobinno and it's been an absolute pleasure to bring it to you and thank you very much for listening and happy cropping. <music>